Hello, everyone. Um, so now we actually, in, in with, with the help of Mario Bassam, we're actually going to go a lot deeper on activity, which is, which is, which is very exciting. Uh, and I know many of you heard, have heard about activity a lot in the past, and we've been talking about the next activity six, but ta-da, it's actually here, so I think that's the exciting, that's the exciting, the exciting part. So today's a little bit of a, I'm gonna do a little bit of a tee up, but I'd rather leave more time um, tomorrow and to really get into the more demos and technical. So this is gonna be less presentation and more demos and exciting things from, from the team. So without, without further ado, let's jump on in. Okay. That's us. I think you hopefully know who we are. There we are. Um, so from uh, from a high level activity standpoint, you know, we've got a lot of success that we see in the market for both community uh, and also enterprise across a lot of different use cases and environments. Um, the first I'll talk about specifically: large ERP vendor, embedded activity, direct at the API level integrated across their, uh, their end to end system and has this as one of a, uh, a cloud-based service, which is frankly one of the mission critical services that they have running. So from a battle-tested, hardened, and uh, robust service, that was a great use case that we've been excited to see uh, from this one vendor. Um, they get kind of shifty about using their name, which is why we're really not able to use names at this point. Um, but it's a three-level acronym in the big German company. Uh, large travel service provider. So there's a uh, bookings provider that many of you may have gone to to do uh, booking, hotel, travel, all of the book, all of the uh, the processes. When someone buys a package, uh, gets initiated through activity and really is orchestrated. This company does seventy billion dollars of, of of business. Uh, we can't, I don't know if we can attribute all of that to the activity as the engine, but this is one of those mission critical examples of how activity is being used today with a travel service provider. A large search provider, one that you probably all use as well, uses uh, really the pluggable persistence part of activity because for them it's about um, scale out and making sure from a database standpoint uh, it is persistent across different environments in case one goes down, there's, 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 a, there's a backup. So they've been really instrumental in Activity 6 to really work in this portable persistence layer. And then there's a, those are just three, there's thousands of others that are used around the globe really that, that we see a lot using Activity day to day, literally as, as, as happens right now. So that's a few points I wanted to kick up. I think the main takeaway for this next version is this continues in that tradition of something battle-tested, something that's used in a lot of different environments. Uh, it's really that evolution of the core. We've learned a lot, and in the spirit of openness and taking feedback, we've learned a lot related to life cycle, life cycle of, of process, life cycle of deployment, uh, dev, build, test, all of that life cycle we've, we, we've, we've learned a lot about. It. Second point is about flexibility, and we've seen it pulled into fully embedded, Integrated at the API level, using the using um, using the app level, There's a lot of different ways that people are using from a flexibility standpoint. But also uh, looking at an enhanced uh, process graph. So this is really like at the core engine uh, memory level, how people pull together processes together, uh, and again, a lot of feedback and iteration. So activity six activity six has been out there, in, in this has been a good thing, but it's kind of had enough bake time. I think in the market that we can actually show some of the cool stuff now. So I guess one of the first tee ups is around dynamic process support. And I'll just tee up a couple of use cases to really show why we did it. Um, and then we'll kind of get into the good stuff. Oh, you should go in time. So Imagine that we have a, a simple uh, maybe a process. Do you want to buy it? Okay. It's for the project. Mm -hmm. So imagine that we have a process that we that was assigned at the beginning as a candidate groups just for users. So anyone in the in the in the, in the company or the, the, the uh, in the users group can just uh, pick up and uh, train the task. 
So at some point, we, just, we, we, we and the runtime after we deployed the process, we realized that this is not a good choice. Yeah. So how can we change that? How can we? Sorry, sorry about that. Oh, that's why I can hear it. Okay. Okay. So uh, just imagine that we have a process where the, there's a user task that we needs to be uh, or is actually at design time is as, uh, the candidate groups. I mean, is uh, for users. And at at runtime, after running several process instances, we realize that okay, that that's not the thing that we should have done. We should have only allowed managers to be able or management to have, to be able to clean those those tasks. So what, how can we change that in, on the fly without actually redeploying the process? So I, I prepared here a simple, a simple uh, example that shows how can we do that. So uh, at first we need to start, I'm starting here a, a standalone uh, in-memory process engine. Uh, and the, the thing that you need to point out, uh, I need to point out here is that you need to enable the process definition and caching. That's how this thing works, actually being able to dynamically change the process de definition at, at, at runtime. So after that, I just go ahead and deploy the process definition. And <coughs> here, here's the magic. I mean, here's the change actually happens. So here, I'm just uh, getting the dynamic VPN service, which is responsible of this dynamic behavior, and changing the user task candidate of the task. So I'm just assigning that this user task, which is actually here, this one, the user task, I want to change its candidate group. So and I want it to be assigned to the management. <coughs> and after I've made the changes, I just go ahead and save that process definition info. And now I can start it, and that will be actually uh, assigned to the, to the management instead of the users. So if I go and query the task and so try to find any, any task for the users, that, that, that should return no, no, no results. So let's go ahead and run it. So if you see from the there's no there's no there's no uh, groups assigned to users. So this is one example. Uh, another example is the service test. I mean the, the, the service class. So at, at runtime, sometimes you need you have a, I mean a, a script class or a service class that is assigned to, to a specific class. And <clears throat> maybe at some point you need to change that class. That that, that class doesn't uh, anymore due to for example. A, uh, third-party uh, changes to a, a, an external system, so that service task doesn't fulfill the needs at, that that were made at, on design time. So, uh, how can I change that at runtime? Uh, again, there's, this is I have put up a, a simple example where there's this is the old service task and there's the new service task. So, what I want to do is switch between this old service task to this new service task uh, without having to I mean redeploy. So uh, I go in here and see this one, and it's again the same thing. I have to uh, stand on stand on uh, in, in memory process, and I have enabled the process definition info. And at here, uh, I'll, I'll actually run twice the process instance. Once showing that the process instance will run with the old one, and the next runtime when I run the process, it will actually run invoke the new new no, new uh, service class. So I go ahead and run it. And see, the first instance will actually run the old service class, and after changing the the new service class name here, when I, I using the dynamic PPN service and calling the method change service task class name, it will change the new service task, and that was invoked instead. The last example here is about the script task. The same thing here. I have a script. Uh, yeah, I have a script here. So I, it's just simple scra uh, script uh, runtime. Uh, again, I want to change it from from this just simple print to another something else. So I go ahead again and have uh, this example, which will change it to something new. <coughs> again, dynamic VPN service change the script task to print something else. So I run it. So if you see, there's the new output that I changed it over here. 
that's just the simple three examples, but uh, the, actually the VPN service actually has more examples here. I can show you. Yeah, it has a bunch of uh, change uh, services that you can. You can change the task priority, you can check description, view date, uh, whatever category, form key. So it, it, it has a lot of uh, dynamic features that you can change it. I mean, attributes of the processes that you can change at runtime. Going back to the slides. Yeah, okay, we just did that. <laughs> okay, the, uh, the other part is the ad hoc sub processes. Ad hoc sub processes are another example of dynamic support. So ad hoc sub processes provide the flexibility to actually change the sequence at runtime. I will choose the sequence at runtime, not change. Uh, in this example, over here, we see three set, two sets of uh, user tasks. The first one is, has a sequence that what's, once you have the first one, you need to sequentially uh, execute the two tasks. But the other three ones are just three tasks. So you can choose any time, I mean, you should, you can, at one time you can choose which one to pick. So there's no predefined uh, def sequence for this, this list flow of the three tasks. Um, so this gives the flexibility actually to, to, to uh, I mean, if you want to be able to do that uh, using the, the predefined sequence, that would involve having like gateways and very complex uh, process definition. This actually simplifies that. Uh, to wrap up, this uh, actually, the dynamic process support is a new convenient way and powerful, I think. And things that to note here is that it's not possible to add tasks or remove existing ones. Uh, updates to the process definition are, are, I mean, the updates are in the process definition level, so you cannot update, for example, the, the definition of just one process instance. Uh, also, uh, at this, I mean, at this stage, it continues, I think, to evolve, uh, best practice actually will emerge. Thank you. Well, this was just a use case of plugable persistence, right? Okay. Um, I think it's better if we go uh, directly on the, that, that first line. Uh, this is a functionality that we already have been... Uh, oh, okay. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> this is a functionality that we already have been talking for quite a while. I was talking with the uh, board uh, this morning. Um, <clears throat> it's not... Um, I think for who of you uh, follow activity. Uh, it's not the first time that uh, you see this line. And uh, <coughs> the, the pluggable the uh, persistency, as Thomas was saying, is uh, an enabler that uh, a lot of our customers are using now uh, to scale with uh, their database and their persistency. Um, it, it's, not, uh, it's not rocket science. Uh, we just, uh, we did, we just, we did some refactoring to our code base. Uh, to put some abstraction, some uh, interfaces on page. Um, you can see here that we have um, uh, a new class, the Entity Manager. This class is the class that you want to talk with when you want to do something uh, with your data inside your, um, your engine. So it's actually the class that you are interested in talking with. And then we have another class here, the Data Manager. Uh, this class is the class that actually does all the uh, CRUD operation with the database, so insert, update, uh, the list of your data. And um, in the end, we have the entity class. This class uh, is, the, the, is um, actually a POSO now. It just uh, holds the data, and then you will store on the database. And uh, back in the time, this class was a little bit, uh, also the others, uh, to the green, were a little bit dirty. We had a mix-up uh, situation where the data uh, were mixed with the, um, the logic of the engine. Uh, so we created all these interfaces uh, to, first of all, to clean the code and make uh, all the uh, ERT uh, more uh, uh, cleaner, but also to allow you to uh, swap one of these classes and actually put in place your implementation. Because maybe a data manager uh, uh, level, you want to put another implementation. Actually, uh, we use in the, our code base, in the engine, we use my bodies. Uh, maybe you are more interested in using something else, uh, hibernate. 
or you want to use uh, Spring Data. Uh, actually, with this uh, change that we made, we allow you and we empower you to do this kind of change. Uh, we allow you to change the data manager implementation uh, to start new entity where you want it. Also, because the entity now are cleaner objects, you can actually use it to uh, store information with uh, um, things like uh, Spring Data, that is more uh, recent tool. <coughs> Um, at this point, um, we have also um, a demo of new uh, interface. Uh, because one of the new things about Active 6 is the fact that we uh, bring a new user interface there to allow you to uh, easily deal uh, with the engine. And we bring in there a lot of functionality uh, like from definition, uh, process definition, um, decision definition and uh, application, uh, um, we allow you to create application and manage it from the user interface. I'll show you because it's easier than explain. <coughs> so this is the new uh, user interface that we implemented with Activity 6. Um, it allows you to do um, a lot of uh, different things. Um, you have also an administration part here. But um, the important thing is that the thing that I was talking uh, before is this area here, um, so the, the kickstart app area of the application. In here, you can create a process and uh, a beacon process, a lot of fantasy. And um, another thing that we have introduced, oh, sorry, this one is really important, I was forgetting about it, is uh, the model key. Um, back in the time when you uh, deployed the process with activity, it uh, wasn't really predictable, uh, the ID of the, um, of the process that you uh, were deploying. And this was a problem, especially when uh, uh, you were uh, redeploying this application in different uh, environments. So now with this model key, you can actually use this, um, uh, the speed to have uh, a clear, uh, predictable ID for your process. So even when you uh, you are going to redeploy this application, you will have uh, a way to reference to this process um, without any uh, confusion. So one, two, three, create it. One, two, three, four. Uh, create the model. Uh, um, from here is the usual uh, way of designing BPMN. Um, application uh, you can create a, you can create a new task um, and um, yeah create a new task or and the task and I don't want to go, go in deeper now explain you how works the process definition uh, because it will require too much time but you have, you have a way to define a process and design it um, next tool, the forms. You can create a new form. Uh, this one is a tool that I was showing also yesterday uh, inside the uh, It's an easy way to create forms. Uh, you don't need to uh, go there and write a lot of HTML to make it working. You just drag and drop uh, the things that you want to have inside your form, and you have uh, a pre-compiled form. So let's call it Econ form. So I can show you, show you how this thing works. In this case, we have a predictable way to refer to this form for file. This thing. And uh, yeah, the form designer is an, it's really an easy tool to, you to create forms. As you can see, it's super easy. You just drag and drop things. Even my grandmother could do it. And, uh, <laughs> and um, then you can use this form inside your process. And uh, without need of writing any HTML or custom code. <coughs> also, this thing will provide you a usable solution. But let's suppose that you want to use this form more than once in more than one process. Uh, you just define one here, and then you will uh, use it. Then we have the decision table. Again, here. Uh, again, here we have the, the key. <coughs> and uh, 
even here, you have a, a graphical tool to define your decision table, uh, so a decision management tool. Um, the battery is fine. <laughs> <laughs> Can you still see the screen or yeah. Yeah. Do you want to jump on the screen? And the last tool is uh, the deployment of application. Actually from this tool you can create an application and through that one uh, you can deploy the process definition that we have just uh, defined. When you will publish the application, uh, you will see here in uh, the main screen of the of the UI. And um, you can just start task. Um, create a new task, and uh, that this would be uh, the task, um, sorry, the process, you can start the process, this would be the process that you have defined inside the process definition too. Um, yeah, I think this, um, I'm, for sure there's not enough time here to go in deeper and show you all the functionality of this tool. Hopefully you got a sense of what uh, this tool does and the things that uh, allow you to do and uh, make for sure faster the adoption of some of the things that we are going to release as part of our team visits. Uh, one question. Are these features available only uh, on Enterprise? Or no, this one, uh, all the things that we are showing now are part of our team the open source solution. Mm -hmm. Can you interface? Yeah, also this interface that I'm showing you now. And also the step editor? Uh, no. Oh. <laughs> 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 Maybe that is. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, that, that looks really familiar to the enterprise yeah. version of activity. Yeah. And um, I saw that there are a lot of things missing which are already in the enterprise. How, how did you make those decisions? What comes into the community version? and? Uh, yeah. What not? <laughs> um, I mean, it's I, I think Richard, uh, like Richard uh, I think he has a point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's an excellent question. I've been working with Doug to figure out how we can make these decisions in a way that's consistent across the entire digital business platform. Uh, the short answer is I don't think we have an absolute clear answer to that yet. Uh, Doug likes to draw the distinction between workflow where you're in a content services perspective, a uh, content services framework, and process service, and, and BPM process services, where you're integrating with additional systems, where you're working with more than one piece of content. Uh, we're, we're currently looking at how in the real world is the community edition, is activity community edition used, uh, and how it would impact it for us to make that a firmer distinction between workflow, where you're not integrating with external systems, and where you're not working with large amounts of content at a time, and real process services. Once we've figured out how, how that is, we would expose the workflow functionality within Alfresco Content Services. And then the next question is, where do we draw the line between the process, oh, thank you. Where do we draw the line between the process services side and activity on the open source? Uh, currently, we're thinking that everything that involves an implementation of initial solution should be seamless between the community edition and the, and the uh, commercial offering, uh, but there'd be stencils that we would remove, uh, stencils that we would preserve for the commercial offering, uh, specifically around integration with third-party systems, uh, scalability, and advanced features like in, rec in information governance, we have some advanced features that are enterprise only. Uh, those would also be enterprise only on the activity side. Um, I know that's really hand wavy and vague. We're going to get more detail as we go, but those, that's our current line of thinking, and if you have feedback, uh, please send an email to Doug Johnson and myself. We'd be very interested to get your feedback. <laughs> the third party is consistent with what we've done on the, on the content side. Yeah. If, if it's enterprise, if you are related to third party systems, because the philosophy always, has always been, well, if there's a third party system in there, and there's you know it's a broader piece of a component, there's probably you know it's probably more enterprises as opposed to a very isolated, independent island of functionality. Which is more community. So that's really, at least that's been consistent. Yeah, but it is very hard to give uh, feedback on something that is not available. Yes, understood. Yeah. And, and we realize it's going to be a, 
This is going to take time to figure out. Um, when's, when did this release happen? I can't spoil it on the slides. Now. Uh, <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. So, so, yeah. um, I, I can't tell you when we are going to make this thing available. But, but, but we are already on the data. We have a branch. Um, you could have already uh, used it. Uh, but we are going to do a uh, release. I'm not telling now because it won't take you to attend to the next slide. Uh, okay, one of the questions is, uh, there is backward compatibility. Uh, the answer is yes. Um, there are things that have changed inside the framework, um, but uh, we still uh, keep um, uh, compatibility. Uh, so if you are running Activity 5, uh, we can ask to drop the new uh, file uh, and execute it. Uh, this will automatically update all the, the database. Uh, at its first run. And then if you have uh, uh, if you have um, any uh, um, process that cannot run on the new engine, um, the Activity 6 engine has a mini version of the Activity 5 in it. So it will uh, allow you to uh, run this process in a compatibility mode. So don't be worried if you have a uh, FTP5 uh, process, it will be automatically if by the engine. If we know how to deal with it. Um, yeah, please, just say, you just drop the word, that's what you just file, and we run. Uh, I, I think the summary is for you. Well, yeah, and the, and the summary is really just a recap of what we talked about, right? Dynamic uh, process support, so I a demo of that. Uh, cloud resiliency is all this pluggable persistence, which we've talked for activity about for a while. Uh, we did form demos, which are the other uh, component, standard-based rule modeling, um, and really that's kind of the main, what we'll call the big marquee features. Uh, I think the next slide is the drum roll slide. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> you, you can have the honors if you'd like. No, no, no. So, officially available Friday is the GA release. So that's when all the stuff is together. Really? Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, yeah. So the, uh, the slide was saying the wait is over. We are going to release it and uh, move forward. Uh, we are going to do the first. Um, we are going to go in the journey in one week. Unless any one of you come out with strong feeling or uh, bad. Uh, I don't know, uh, idea uh, review about the work that we have done. Mm -hmm. I think if everything goes smoothly, uh, we should be able to go in, the, in um, <coughs> one week time. So this exciting part. Ta-da! <laughs> also, uh, hopefully this uh, will answer to your question. Um, <coughs> okay, uh, this is about the future, the things that we want to do after the version 6. Because, uh, for me, version 6 is important to release it. This, uh, something uh, that we must do it because we uh, uh, own this thing to the community. But uh, personally, uh, I think there are more exciting things coming and more exciting things uh, that are interesting to see inside the engine uh, in general in the, in the process uh, space. And um, um, more recent things, I would say, how to improve the microservices architecture and allow you also uh, to deploy a more uh, thin granularity uh, part of this engine. Maybe some of you will be interested in not deploying, sorry, not deploying the whole uh, engine, even though it's, it's not so big our engine, but maybe you want to deploy only the form part of our, uh, only the form engine of our, um, of our process engine, because you don't want to have all the parts and uh, use it as part of your application. So I'm really interested in seeing these kind of things, how to have a clean granularity and uh, bring the uh, process service in the microservices world. Uh, the more work about the system services. So as we bring everything in the microservices world, create also other kind of services, an uh, ecosystem of other services around uh, the process service. And uh, of course, more responsive architecture. So uh, we are looking at things like uh, uh, spin data and um, um, reactive uh, um, reactive programming, reactive manifesto, to make even the, the engine faster than it is today. Um, yeah, and 
this is um, uh, the part of um, well, our process engine uh, goes inside the uh, enterprise part. So uh, we bring then this Activity 6 engine inside uh, our enterprise product. Uh, it's something that we will be uh, doing in the next months, uh, hopefully for the end of the year or next year. We see some um, results in this phase. Um, and uh, I think one point where I'm really interested uh, is the thing that uh, I personally feel really painful is this point here, how to see the upgrades from the open source part to the enterprise. Because uh, this is the, one of the feedback that I get more often. Uh, okay, I start with your open source project. I want to switch to the enterprise because I see the value of the enterprise. There are more functionalities. How I do it? Because I try it myself. There, is, there are these kind of problems. Often we, found, we find ourselves to troubleshoot some kind of problems because there's no clear path of upgrading. It's definitely something that we are going to take a, as first thing in the next few months. Fast uh, deployment and uh, modeling, continuous delivery. Uh, this is something that we have started as part of the uh, key that I was showing you to have a clear and predictable uh, reference to the process and forms and uh, the application. Uh, we will uh, uh, carry on this work also on the, um, on the enterprise side because of course when you deploy this application on uh, various staging, uh, development, QA, the normal uh, continuous integration system that we all have in our company, uh, you want to have a predictable way to refer to process forms and so on. <coughs> And yeah, and also, as I said, we are going to do also some work uh, around uh, data management and uh, also other integration in, um, in this area with other services. So, so this is basically when Activity Engine is on inside of Alfresco Content Services, we're on an older version of Activity inside of Alfresco Content Services. This is basically getting to this more modern uh, engine. Uh, point number one, looking at really the workflows that we have by default inside of Alfresco Content Services as well, uh, and then really reconciling the forms between the two different environments so that it's a consistent metaphor, it's something that scales across the two. That's a legacy problem that we have to get around. So a lot of that is really kind of evolving how activities inside content <coughs> services. The last build out, um, if you could hit my yep. is um, related to ADF2 as um, really you're on the front lines of this because it's the APIs between uh, process services and uh, ADF and really making sure that all comes together as a yep. major for development. Um, Mario is the, the guy that runs the engineering team for both uh, AppDev framework and activity, so all this rolls into you, which makes your life easier now <laughs> that, uh, that, that it's collaborating between what you're doing in ADF and activity. So that's that's awesome. to, uh, to go too far. You don't have to ask yourself, right? <laughs> exactly. Look in the mirror. You have what do you think about it? <laughs> uh, so really, the, and, and this is one of the ways we organize, just so that, again, we have a single point and you can screen my decision. So um, you'll, see, you'll be seeing a lot more of Mario. <laughs> okay. So I think this one, I think that's it. Yeah. yeah. So it's, uh, um, of course, this is an open source project, so what we really want is you, you collaborate with us with this project. So if you are not already involved in an activity, uh, and you didn't know maybe before about activity, open source project, uh, please get in touch with us, or go on, um, on GitHub, there is our repository activity, and um, get interested, uh, check out our project, uh, start typing something, uh, if you can submit a pull request, we are happy to receive pull request, and uh, accept it, as long as they are quality uh, requests. Uh, so we ask really uh, little things when you make a request, a little documentation and tests to make. Um, it is a favor that you do to yourself also to the others that will come and check out the engine and the, pro and the project uh, after. Because we often forget to uh, test, because we say, okay, this is a problem for a future me, and then the future you one day will come to uh, uh, asking why. <laughs> so, yeah. <coughs> so, these are the list of the guys if you can, uh, that you can get in contact if you want to know more. Uh, that's it. That's it. Any open questions?
questions? Microphone? No, no, I don't need microphone. Uh, maybe. Uh, once again, uh, one last question um, regarding the government part and process that we are facing very much. What is the Alfresco uh, opinion or direction in, uh, in uh, maybe developing the digital signature and stamp and something like this uh, in the future? Or is this still something that uh, Alfresco is not doing? Uh, um, I, I think it's a, first of all, I think it's a interesting case. Uh, maybe if you, uh, if you attend to the um, John Newton uh, keynote yesterday, I think he already uh, talked also about this space. And uh, I personally uh, really interested in uh, uh, digital signatures with uh, algorithms <coughs> like uh, blockchain, or uh, this kind of thing. Uh, I know that also in Europe, uh, they are looking uh, in this area. Uh, on the immediate roadmap, we don't have anything. Else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on the immediate roadmap, we don't have anything. What about some case studies? Maybe some. Yeah, uh, good, that. Uh, experience with some outside. That, as I said, this is an open source project. Uh, the community running. Uh, if you have a bad use case and you uh, feel that, I don't know, as I feel that blockchain uh, is a good idea, mm -hmm. uh, some interpol request, we integrate it in, the, in our engine. I, I, this is what I do for even personally. When uh, I'm not busy uh, with the, the company, uh, when I have time in the weekend, uh, I, I, I ask some code and maybe I, put, I submit some requests because um, I think it's a good idea. Okay, thank you. Um, in our fresco, then oh sorry, you know yeah, uh, myself. Okay, sorry. Um, in, Just my yeah. in our fresco, uh, there are different uh, add-ons for for digital signature and for some signature. For example, uh, no, 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 the, sign, the, the others are, are probably sign. better. Yeah, so so we just have to adapt all these uh, electronic signature solutions to to activity which impact this very easy. So we can have electronic signature in, in a person in a field. Yeah. Uh, if, if, I can, <laughs> if I can add uh, one thing, I think this is also uh, the, good th the good part about bringing the content community and the process community uh, closer. Because we, uh, also this is all the, the whole idea about the digital platform, we can reuse uh, the solution across content and process and not, uh, and not always make a solution ad hoc for each of these systems. So um, I saw it's it's on the roadmap, but uh, right now, um, is it possible to create an application inside um, Activity Community and import and run it within the latest enterprise version of Activity? Um, <laughs> yeah, you can create application. I think we don't have the support uh, for the export. I think yeah, okay. you can create application. some workflow inside uh, Alfresco. And then uh, like uh, when we got some uh, complex cases, we were told that it's possible to use the standalone activity. But what I see that the workflow, how we develop and the forms, etc., we develop in embedded uh, activity is quite different uh, even now if we use a uh, uh, activity, <coughs> sorry, uh, standalone, uh, like those forms looks quite different. I mean, they, they don't give the same now uh, you talked about like uh, that there is a plan to mm -hmm. upgrade uh, yep. in this uh, content like uh, activity also in the content uh, services. Mm -hmm. So going in the future, uh, can we uh, expect that uh, today we have some use case where we are using the embedded activity, and then tomorrow we thought like we want to expand our uh, processes, and then we want to uh, then we go to the standalone, and then they are uh, like yeah. smooth or they look okay. exactly the same. Yeah, I got your question. Um, I think the, the space um, where in the direction where we are moving uh, about this point is uh, we want to um, not anymore support um, embedded engine 
with the um, inside the content, we starting uh, having the content uh, properly uh, working alongside with the process. And this uh, will be also part of uh, all the digital platform conversation that we are having now. So you will see more uh, a proper engine working alongside with the content in the future. So you will be able to use the REST APIs and not just, uh, you, you will have more functionality than you have right now with the, the wrapper that we provide as a workflow engine inside the content. So really, I mean the question then, because right now if you choose the embedded engine, uh, <laughs> okay, uh, like we work with the enterprise uh, edition, so if we have the embedded engine, then it comes free with the uh, Alpha mm -hmm. Score. And then if you are now going for this uh, standalone, mm -hmm. then it's coming with the price. So uh, now, uh, like as you said, that it will be developed as a separate like uh, uh, mm -hmm. thing. So will it be available as part of the Alfresco platform, or it will be again like we have to choose whether yeah. I we use uh, uh, workflow or we don't use? I mean, uh, so will there be any something basic content services available, uh, mm -hmm. process services available within the Alfresco based platform or not? And that's what I was referring to earlier. We're, we're drawing a distinction between workflow and business process management uh, process services. So workflow, meaning you're in the context of a specific document moving through your organization, that's part of Alfresco Content Services, it's part of Alfresco Community Edition. It will be leveraging the open source activity as a service, like Mario mentioned. So you, we have solar, we have a database, we have activity, <coughs> It's not embedded, it's a separate service. Okay. Customers, people who de decide to deploy on Alfresco, Contents, on Alfresco Community Edition and are building something, will, will understand there's this line of set of APIs that when you upgrade to enterprise mm -hmm. is part of Alfresco Content Services, but if there's this other set of APIs that if you upgrade to enterprise requires the full-blown process services solution. We're figuring out where to draw that line, we're figuring out how to communicate that line, API namespacing, something like that. But we are drawing that distinction. If, it's, if you're in the context of a single piece of content, um, you're not integrating with external systems, uh, you, straightforward stuff we do in content services every day, that belongs in content services. You don't need an additional license. But we want to make it clear when you do. Uh, the way we answer that question is we go out and talk to people like you and figure out what do you do with your workflows? What is a normal workflow? Do we think it's inbounds or out of bounds? You know, how do we want to do this? We're in that process. I've completed three of those interviews so far. I expect we're going to do a few dozen of them uh, before we can answer that question with clarity. But in general, yes, uh, there will be a way to do workflow within content services. We will use the activity service to do that, but there will be a line upon which you still need the full-blown process services license. And I know it's time for the break. So oh, is it? Yes. Uh, so no more questions? Or? It's very interesting here. Yeah, we don't do break. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean, like, this is the most useful part of the Yeah, so let's keep going. It's good to know. Uh, we, could be, we could be asking Mary questions holding coffee, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what Mark wants. <laughs> yeah, if, if you want to talk more about this topic, uh, just stop me. Uh, well, let's, let's keep I'll going. For, if people want to leave, you can leave. We won't, we won't be disappointed. But yeah. if you want to stay, let's stay. Other questions? Excuse me. Um, we use um, Alfresco Enterprise. We've got some custom workflows in there. Um, we were chatting to our account manager about what we would get if we also licensed the uh, process. Um, and they were saying, oh, well, there's some integration pieces, and what will happen is your users will click on something, and then they'll need to pick whether they want to run a workflow locally or on process service. And of course, your users will know which one it is. And I was sort of shaking my head and say, my users don't even know what workflow to run when they're only in one place, not two. Um, are you giving any more thought to how to ease that transition where you've got things running on both embedded and process service and make it easier for confused users, not necessarily your Uber users, but um, someone who's been told they have to run a workflow and they ring you up and then you talk them through pressing what button so they can start the workflow, mm -hmm. that kind of struggling user. The short answer is we're thinking about it. Uh, I've proposed that to the team. We did a little workshop. There were about six different solutions. I have no idea which one's going to be. I can't even explain it. I got confused. So, um, but yes, we understand it's an important transition that we need to worry about. Uh, long term, there won't be an embedded activity. So 
part of the challenge we're having technically is how fast we make that. Can we migrate all the embedded stuff to a separate activity? If so, then the problem goes away. But yeah, we're still figuring that out. Yeah, a lot of these, how does, what are the basic services inside of uh, community uh, El Fresco? And a lot of that's changing because, again, we're moving to a, you know, an upgraded activity engine. We're going to be more consistent. There's benefits of you know, similar forms, metaphors. But this is part of the things that are still being worked out is, well, how much is enough to keep things going? We don't want to break, we don't want to break certain items. So there's certainly a philosophy of there should be some element of parity where we're not putting people in jeopardy. But how can we streamline either integration to third-party systems or making things more flexible for non-technical users? Well, that's more enterprise, but the, as, as Richard said, the quick answer is all this is happening in, in real time and we're basically doing some validation around that now. Other questions? There must be more. More people really want coffee. <laughs> okay. All right, we're done.